It's not autumn leaves. It's not there will never be another you. It's not rhythm changes. Today, we are going to dig into a classic standard that you will find on this album. If you haven't guessed already, this is the tune Work Song, written by Nat Adderley. Uh, appearing on this album, Them Dirty Blues, and many other places in jazz, this is sort of a super standard, probably one that many of us already have some familiarity with. That might raise the question, well, why the heck are we talking about this today? A lot of us consider this probably an easy tune, but I think it has many of the concepts that are really essential for us to be great improvisers, and it's a wonderful place to work at many different levels, whether you're a beginner, intermediate, or advanced player. All right, everyone, it's good to see you again. Thanks for tuning in this week. Before we jump into things, I'm gonna give another very short shameless plug. Go down to the description. I mentioned this on the last lesson. Go check out the links for YouTube, Facebook, all that kind of stuff for my new band, Paper Canaries. Hit me with a like, hit me with a follow, all that type of good stuff. I'm not going to bother with you anymore about this lesson, but I'm really trying to get that band out there. So, you know, do me a solid if you enjoy the stuff I do here on YouTube. So we're getting into work song. From my perspective, there are three main concepts that we want to deal with when we are working on this composition. We'll take each one of these apart, talk about a couple of ways that we can practice them. I would also add that this approach of thinking about what is a given song, what are the concepts that are there, and sort of connecting these two things is one of the main ways that I like to practice. I don't just necessarily like to work on a tune just to work on that tune. I like to think of what are the concepts that I need to improve on or want to improve on and think about what standards might help to practice those concepts or vice versa. If there's a particular standard I want to learn, I might think about what concepts are present in that standard so it can kind of work across all the material that I work on. So it's important to think about how can we can apply this stuff over many tunes, not just a single tune. All right, our first concept is one that we talk about a lot on this channel, and that is minor pentatonics. There are two ways that I would encourage you to think about this concept on this tune. The first is just our regular old minor pentatonic scale that, again, we've talked about a lot here. This is an essential music theory building block. We're not going to dig into it too much today just because we have covered it quite a bit. But it helps us create melodies that sound like this. Incredibly useful and just super important foundation. So if you don't know that, you got to start there and being able to manipulate that, build some vocabulary, all that type of good stuff. The other thing I would encourage you to try on this tune or any tune where you want sort of that blues sensibility, but maybe you just want some other directions to go, some different vocabulary, is actually to start with the major pentatonic. And that might seem weird on this tune because we're in F minor. Why would I think F major? But instead of leaving a major third, we're going to create a major pentatonic scale, which is the root, the second, the third, the fifth, and the sixth, with the root on top again. That one sounds like this. Since we're playing in minor, we're gonna flat the third. This is going to help lead us so some other really cool areas of the language. There's a lot of great ideas that sort of use this collection of notes. I find that a lot of students overlook this kind of side of the blues, this sound in sort of that blues feel. They go right to minor pentatonic, right to the blue scale, and they never really get this stuff happening. And there's a ton of language that lives within this scale and the ideas that it can inform. So that's concept number one. In all honesty, that's going to get you through most of this tune. Most of this tune is F minor. The blues and kind of the language that surrounds the blues is the key to sounding good on this tune. You can play all the bebop you want on this tune, but if you don't have the blues kind of under command, you're not going to sound very convincing. Essential on this tune and across our entire improvisational language, that blues element needs to be there. All right, let's jump to concept number two. This is superimposing two five ones where appropriate. This song is not a song that has a lot of two five ones in it, just in a sort of straight up chord progression. So 
It might feel like, well, I can't lean on that stuff that I've practiced, but there's lots of places where you can superimpose two fives in order to access that sound if you so desire. In order to do this, we're gonna look for all the places where we have dominant functioning chords. Not necessarily just dominant chords, but chords that function as dominant, so they function as five. The first one of these is the C7 chord that appears in bar seven and eight. So we have two bars of C7 here. If we just played it like regular, it might end up sounding a little bit like this. with that I might think that a lot of the times but maybe I want to go in a little different direction maybe I'm playing more eighth note lines I want to sort of have a little bit more bebop sensibility or I want to be able to access some of the two five ones that I've practiced since that chord is a five chord we can precede it by its sort of two chord that's connected to it so we're going to F uh, we're resolving to F minor so we want to think all right well what's a two five one in F minor it would be G minor seven or G minor seven flat five to C seven then eventually resolving back to F so instead of leaving the C chord where it is and putting the two chord before it, we're actually gonna slide that C cover, excuse me, C chord over one bar and then put the G chord in the seventh bar. So we'll have in the second phrase, two bars of F minor, one bar of G minor seven or G minor seven flat five, and then a C seven chord. So we get that two five one that's gonna take us back to the eventual resolution. Let's hear what that would sound like. Now, the way the rhythm section plays is gonna be very subtly different. It's not a huge difference in the way the rhythm section plays, but it's probably going to lead you, the soloist, to think about different ideas, and that's the key with this sort of substitution. <laughs> Very, very common, super useful approach when you see those dominant chords, especially when they occur over more than one bar. Now, if you have that under your command, you can go even a little bit further in this same location. One of the common substitutions that people like to do here is rather than just doing two five, they'll do like a sidestepping two five, where we do a two five one, excuse me, just a two five, a half step up in the first bar, and then resolving to the regular two five in the second bar. So for example, in bar seven, we're now going to have a two, five, one to G flat, but we never actually get to G flat. It resolves down to G and then that two, five continues to resolve to F. So we get an A flat minor seven to D flat, G minor seven to C seven, then to F minor. So the more we start to stretch the harmony like this, a lot of times clarity and simplicity in our ideas is what's going to be effective. Since we're already sort of outside of the key, Playing like an idea with a million half steps in it and a lot of alterations is not gonna give you that sound of like, oh, I'm over here outside of the key and then I get back into it. You really actually wanna be strongly in G flat or strongly indicating this A flat minor seven to D flat. So a lot of times triadic ideas work really well here or ideas that don't necessarily have a ton of chromaticism and maybe they just move down by a half step. That is a very effective approach with this sort of changes. <laughs> Okay, our third and final concept is actually probably the most important one, maybe a bit of a buried lead here, but that is how we navigate through the last four bars of this tune. So the last four bars has pretty meat and potatoes type of changes. It's F dominant seven to B flat dominant seven to D flat dominant seven to C seven to F minor seven. We might think of that as a one chord that's dominant resolving to four, resolving to sort of like a two five one, but the two chord is substituted um, by, by a tritone. Really, really common here, but it's not necessarily an area where we can just rely on any of our preconceived licks necessarily. So we need to know how to move through here in melodic ways. This is a great place to practice arpeggios and then learn how we can move from arpeggios into turning those type of kind of music theory nuts and bolts into actually musical and melodic passages. So let's walk through the process of how we do this. Cause like I said, this is probably the most important concept to take away from this tune or that this tune really gives you an opportunity to practice in a very specific and actually kind of like contained space, which is gonna help us to grow. So we wanna start by just playing the straight up arpeggios through those four bars. We're just gonna go ascending to start. <laughs> Now 
Now you might have noticed I just did the seventh chords where I had a full bar. And then on the measure where I had two chords per bar, I actually just did the triads. I just played the root, third, fifth of each one of those chords. I did change the rhythm a little bit um, just to make it feel a little more swinging. But that's a lot of times how I like to handle those type of bars for this type of exercise. It's just a little easier to execute on your horn. All right, once we can do it ascending, we're going to do it descending. I tend to find that students struggle with that a little bit more. We're descending from the seventh or the flatted seventh in each one of these, but you could descend from any note, but it's all about being able to go down before you have gone up. A lot of times people like to go up and then come back down the chord. That makes it a little easier, but you gotta be able to do it going down without having gone up first, just to make sure you have really good command over the harmony. Once you're strong going up and down the chords, then you can start to move into some inversions. Now you can practice as much or as little of this as you want to that you feel like you need to in order to gain mastery over this harmony. I can tell you that I find a lot of people, they get it ascending, they kind of get it descending, and then they move on, but they don't really have command that they can play it anywhere on their horn, start on any chord tone, and that is really important to turning these into melodies. So having really good command of the foundation is incredibly important here. So don't shortchange yourself on this step. So all that playing is very functional. That's probably practice stuff you already are a little bit familiar with. Let's talk about actually moving this into a musical context. What we're gonna do is we're gonna start to look for the voice leading that moves through these different changes. And depending on what note we start on, where our voice leading choices might take us. So say we arpeggiate up through the first chord. That's gonna leave us on a high E flat. We're gonna say that as essentially like a last note in the measure that we're gonna play. So our next chord is a B flat chord. So we wanna think about what chord tones are close to that E flat that we could start our next arpeggio on. So we ended on E flat. So maybe we could go up to the F or we could go down to the D. Now the classic choice would be to go down to the D because then we have the flat seven of the F chord resolving to the third of the B flat chord. And that's probably what I would do would be my first two bars. So then I get up one chord, down the next with close voice leading. That's what we wanna think about through the rest of these bars. So say we move on to the next bar on the D flat chord, so we end it on an F. So if we think about our D flat chord, we have a D flat, an F, and an A flat. So the F is a common tone. So we might wanna say, all right, well, I'm gonna stick with the common tone to be my next bar starting. And then in the second half of that bar, if I do uh, my triad on the D flat chord, F, A flat, D flat, I think about what's my closest resolution note on the C chord, C, E natural, G. It's gonna be down a half step to the C, so I'm gonna descend that. Now I'm on an E to end that chord, and I've gotta think, all right, well, I'm going to an F minor seven chord. I could resolve down a half step to the E flat or resolve up to the F. Probably the F is the strongest resolution. So if we put the whole thing together, we get this idea. That is the exercise that you need to gain really good command over in order to be able to build eighth note lines that are not preconceived as licks. This will help you to hear where those little lines need to move through this. Now that's very technical the way we just did it. The more you do it, the, the quicker it will become and the more intuitive it will become. So what if we started on a different note? Rather than ascending from the root, what if we descended from the top root and went down to that first chord? So now I'm ending on the A natural of that F chord. So again, I think, well, I'm moving to B flat after that. What are my close resolution notes? I could go down to the A flat. I could go up to the B flat. So in this case, I chose to go down to the A flat. That takes me up through the B flat chord. Again, I end on an F, just in the high octave. So again, I'm gonna think that's a common tone between B flat and D flat. So I descend through D flat, F, D flat, A flat, and then I'm moving to C. What is my closest resolution note? It's a G and so on and so forth through the rest of the chords. Working this in as many permutations will give you good command over manipulating arpeggios in this way. From there, you start to move it into some different rhythms. Maybe you omit some of the chord members. You don't always play all the chord tones in each chord. You sort of stretch things out rhythmically or condense things rhythmically, and you can come up with some relatively musical sounding passages just using arpeggios. <laughs> to 
to my ear, that sounds like a well improvised line. And it may be something that at first you're sort of preconceiving so you know where that voice lead is going. But the more you practice this, the more you'll just start to understand and be able to think forward and think about where your line needs to go to fit into in excuse me, to fit into each new change. That is the real key to being sort of an organic improviser, not just relying on licks or preconceived patterns or any of that type of stuff. Cool, cool. That does it for work song. If you can do those three things really well, great pentatonic melodies, superimposing two fives in the right places, and navigating the last four bars of this tune using arpeggios in a melodic way, you can sound really killing on this work song, but also on a million other jazz standards. Those are really key concepts that carry over to lots of different tunes. A lot of people might think this is sort of a beginner, maybe an intermediate tune, and I wouldn't say they're necessarily wrong. It does have a relatively simple harmonic structure, relatively simple melodic structure, so it's a great tune if you're just sort of like getting through the blues, ready to work on some other stuff, but there's lots of things for all of us to practice. So I will see you in the woodshed.